Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Lily Honey. I am from Huntsville, Alabama, originally. I am also an alumni of Bama Anthro for my undergrad. Um, my senior year of high school, fr freshman year of undergrad was 2018. Um, and then I started the accelerated master's program late fall 2020, took one class and then started in my main graduate program. Um, and now I'm here to kind of tell y'all about what we decided to do for my master's thesis project, um, which wound up being a 3D collection documentation project um, in collaboration with the Chickasaw Cultural Center. Okay, just kick spacebar. North, click. Hey, okay. All right. So first off, I want to start off with why collaborate, why I decided to collaborate. So um, in late 2020, when we were first exploring different like topics that I could pursue for my uh, master's thesis work, I kind of brought up the idea to Dr. Blair that I didn't really have anything concrete that I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something in museums or collections work, some kind of like backroom heritage type thing. Um, so we came up with the idea to propose a collaboration to one of UA stakeholder communities. Um, and then some people may say, what is a stakeholder? So I'll go ahead and just like touch that. And a stakeholder is basically anybody that has any kind of involvement or investment in your project. And I've heard people say source communities for things like archeology span and museums as well. Um, and I kind of like the whole source community thing because that is, um, communities, um, these indigenous communities are the sources of a lot of this cultural material that we work with as Southeastern archaeologists. So um, that is one of the reasons we decided to go into collaboration. Um, and then during my museum certificate work in my uh, graduate program, I read about the stakeholder management approach in museums and how that would support sustainable development for institutions in the future. And that um, approach basically um, kind of calls for museums to work through and with their stakeholders in order to develop on their projects. That way the museum is developing in a sustainable manner and uh, we are working past, you know, the NAGPRA minimum level of collaboration and we're going past that um, and multiplying our forces for heritage stewardship. Um, so I also thought it would be neat to see um, how we are able to integrate collaboration into academic training and promote experiential learning in this kind of like situation for myself. Um, and if it could be repeated in the future, how other people could like pursue these like experiential learning and service learning opportunities through a collaboration through the museum. Uh, so not only would this type of collaboration support the community building, uh, but it also develops upon my own experience and collaborative work before I go into the future roles of um, whatever I wind up doing in a museum one day. Right now I'm at the Honors College advising if anybody has an undergrad in the Honors College, so my wife. Um, but yeah, so that is why we decided to collaborate. Um, oh, and I also want to note um, that we also wanted to take into consideration who um, is representing like archeological and pre-contact cultures in Alabama. So through museums work, um, it's important to consider the different, uh, basically points of view that are being represented and that are being involved in the museum work and the sharing of the culture. So that was also something that was very important to us in the formation of our collaboration was uh, putting Chickasaw views first and making sure that they had uh, all the rights over all of our data and resultant materials. Um, and here I have a map included from the uh, Chickasaw and Kano Foundation, and it kind of shows the traditional homelands of the Chickasaw Nation. Um, and you can see over here, this area is actually where I grew up and where I'm from, and it was right on the borderlands uh, between the Chickasaw and the Cherokee. So uh, this project was important to me personally. Um, just because of that, and I wanted to see us move above this knowledge production of a community to knowledge production with a community. So that leads us on to our uh, orientation. Let's see if I can't move this yonder. Okay. Um. So theoretical orientation for the project. 
Um, to begin with, we looked at different models of learning. Um, we enjoyed the concept of two-way learning, which is similar to the concept of graded knowledge, if you're familiar with collaborative work um, in indigenous uh, communities. Um, and this describes a learning environment created by collaboration with the Senate communities in which both parties have an equal uh, standing of power. And in this situation, both people or both institutions would work to achieve a common goal while learning from each other through mutual respect, commonality, understanding, and flexibility. Um, and we definitely came across all of those in our collaboration, which I will go into shortly. Um, in addition to that, we also uh, took tenants from critical race theory, as well as socially mediated learning in the context of museums work. And in that context, these different theories call into question who has the right to educate the public on indigenous cultures. Once again, um, socially mediated learning and specific references, the different interactions between someone who is authoritatively teaching somebody something and someone who is learning. Um, so in this case, in the museum, this concept is kind of seen in an exhibition uh, museums are really trusted sources inf of information for the public. So if you're reading something in an exhibit, you're more likely to think it's true. So it's really, really important to emphasize collaboration to make sure that everything that is being presented to the public is what should be presented to the public, according to the uh, uh, culture being displayed, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So uh, we wanted to consider the authoritative roles that we would play um, in presenting culture in the museum. And we wanted to be able to move the Chickasaw into that authoritative role instead in this project in particular. Um, this way, the indigenous peoples are able to represent their culture and their ancestors as their community sees appropriate. And um, then that moves us on to uh, free choice learning models, um, which is something I get really excited about in museums, um, especially when it comes to uh, indigenous history and indigenous culture. Um, I, my family is a member of the Achota tribe of um, Cherokee Indians of Alabama, and I was in Indian education growing up, but I still didn't know so much. And this is why museums are a really important source of information, especially about pre-contact Alabama history. Um, because our general education, public education curriculum is not cutting it for history. So um, I'll go into the free choice learning concepts. Um, and that is that there are five different types of learning structures, basically. Um, you have formal, you have out of school organized types of learning. There are non-formal and informal types of learning. And then there's free choice and voluntary learning. So free choice and voluntary learning in this sense is somewhere where you can go to get information that you're not necessarily set up and going there to get information, like a school set up, if that makes sense. Um, so for example, people learn from their friends and family, from the schools and universities, electronic media libraries, community organizations, their workplace, um, print media, the internet, um, and then science centers and museums are one of the most important sources for people to be able to um, take in different concepts in like a non-structured way. And studies have been done that show that museums are actually one of the most effective ways of teaching people because of these free learning, um, different learning environments that museums create and that what people learn at museums really actually sticks with them better um, in the future because of that. Uh, so this little graphic down here kind of describes that. Okay. And we wanted to kind of work on the CCC's capabilities, um, the Chickasaw Cultural Center's capabilities for virtual programming because of that. Um, because with this collection documentation project, the goal was eventually to have models that we could have um, on like a little uh, website, like a little link on their website to where anybody could go and like view collection items that the Chickasaw have at their cultural center um, in 3D. And that would be an extremely important resource for the Chickasaw community, not only in Sulphur, but anywhere um, to have that option to do a free choice type of learning um, about the Chickasaw culture through their website. Okay, 
So then I wanted to move on to the timeline of our collaboration in case anybody else has anybody that's interested in doing this. I'll kind of go through what happened when, when our communication was. Um, and I'd like to point out that the things in blue aren't really collaboration events, but they're like life events to people that were involved in the collaboration. So um, our first interest meeting with the Chickasaw Nation happened on uh, April 26, 2021. Um, and then we had a follow-up meeting on May 8th in which we discussed collaborative possibilities with their uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And then on October 13th, we were actually put in contact with the CCC and representatives from the CCC in order to discuss having a partnership meeting. Um, they were really interested in the 3D collections um, project that I kind of had in my head because I came into this project kind of wanting to do something having to do with 3D in the first place anyway, because I've been with Dr. Tocabini learning photogrammetry, um, working on a project with the DAR uh, preserving tombstones. That's what like really niche thing, but I don't know. It's like similar to how Dr. Tocabini does his Maya limestone things. I do my limestone tombstones in, in New Oak, but anyway, that's beside the point. But we realized um, in November of 2021 that Agisoft Metashape, which is the photogrammetry uh, software that Dr. Tokovini uses and all of our U.S. students are trained on, um, that software actually would not be an applicable program to use for this collaboration because of their uh, licensing agreements. Um, any models created through the Agisoft Metastate uh, software then become property of the company Agisoft. And as the Chickasaw's legal team was looking over our agreements and stuff, they were like, wait, no, we got to shift gears kind of and get a different software. So then we went through the process of trying to find different softwares and we worked with the Chickasaw uh, Nation's legal and IT team. And that process took a couple of months. And during that process, we also realized that we would need a uh, memorandum of understanding slash memorandum of appointment for me to be able to go and actually do my internship at the Chickasaw's um, Cultural Center's actual campus in Silver, Oklahoma. So we started really trying to grind and get that done because we had set the dates for my original, we had set the internship dates basically for uh, July 7th, is that July yet? July 17th through July 30th. Um, and I had already submitted my IRB, so we were ready to go on that. Um, then uh, we got an email. Let's see. Uh, yes, I got an email on July 3rd saying, you know, hey, we really still have, we have that MOU still in progress and we're rushing it, but just wanted to let you know that it might not be done in time for you to come out here and for us to collaborate in the original internship. That This is where the flexibility comes in because everybody collaborating is also a real person and also has something going on in their life. Um, as you can see back in June, one of my collaborators had a child. So she was actually on maternity leave and would have been on maternity leave if I had gone during my original internship date. And she actually wound up being really crucial to the collaboration in the first place. So it's a good thing she was there when I wound up going. Um, but anyway, um, let's see, I submitted my RB, the original internship date passed, but I wasn't able to go because the MOU was still in progress. Also, I had really bad health episode in the end of June, 2022 that I am still dealing with. Um, but yeah, so that came and passed and we just still, you know, we keep working on the MOU, um, keep them working on learning clone and figuring out how the app worked getting IRB protocols approved. And then we finally got the MOU signed and executed on August 28th, nope, 23rd. But by then school had started and the two week internship kind of forced me to put my internship in a break, either fall break or uh, Christmas break. So we decided to switch gears and stick the internship date during uh, fall break. Um, and then I was able to defend my thesis proposal on September 30th and everything was great. And then that night my mom called me and she let me know that my grandpa has not been doing well and he had not been doing well for a couple of years. So we knew that it was kind of time. And she, our plan originally was for my mom to come and get me and we would take her car to Oklahoma. So we had to change logistics and my mom decided, <laughs> and this was three days before we were supposed to leave. Um, my mom decided that instead of uh, her coming down and getting me and us taking her car, she would send my grandma down with the car to get me and then we would go that way. 
And so I was like, okay, we're switching gears. We're going to make it work. And then um, on the 1st of October, my Airbnb got flooded and he had to cancel. So, um, yeah, so I had to make arrangements to push the internship date back because everything else in the town is a really small town. It's really rural area of Oklahoma. Um, every other Airbnb and hotel room in the town was actually booked because that's the weekend of the Chickasaw's National Festival that they have at the Chickasaw Cultural Center. So they didn't have room for old Will. Um, but that wound up being a good thing, actually, because my grandmother wound up having COVID at that time. And my grandpa passed away um, on October 4th. So after that, we kind of, you know, we're picking up the pieces and figuring stuff out and decided to do the actual internship on Christmas break, which leads us to December 11th of 2022, about a year ago, until um, December 23rd. And that um I was actually able to make it to Oklahoma that time I got there that time uh and then we did our internship while um Christmas break was going on and it was serving very much Christmas they had uh the Christmas radio on the Chickasaw's radio channel and everything so that's what we were dealing with and then that leads us into this year which has consisted of collaborative article writing so yeah, so we got our collaboration done. Um, now I'll actually talk about the project itself. Um, here I have two pictures of the Chickasaw Cultural Center. Um, down below is the Aasachi, and that is their um, collections facility, kind of where they put researchers, historical researchers that aren't in like archives. They have a different building for that. Um, but up here you can see their exhibit center. They have a really large campus and it's really nice if you ever get a chance. Here is a dot with where sulfur is in Oklahoma. The Chickasaw Nation is like in this area so you can kind of orient yourself. And down here I have a Polaroid of one of my collaborators, uh, Adrian Dashjir, <laughs> out front that I took before I left. Um, which is a nice touch. So I figured I would throw that in so y'all can see her. Um, and then on the other half of the slide, I have kind of clone topics. So I kind of wanted to go in to the difference between Agisoft Metashape and clone. Um, Agisoft Metashape is more of a professional phot photogrammetry program that can exactly model um, different objects that are being scanned, whereas clone is more of a consumer a program, if that makes sense, a consumer software. It's a iOS app that you can download on an iPad or an Android. And basically you use a phone and this, what they call the clone mat, um, you basically print that out, lay it flat. And for bigger objects, you have to like get it sized up and like get it printed bigger. But basically you print that out, you set it on the table, you open the app, and then this dome right here is like an AR dome that the uh, app puts over whatever you're scanning and it orients itself using the clone mat, um, little orienters right through here. And each one of these little boxes like goes away, like clears out as you like go around the object and the app captures a picture from that angle to where you can get things from different angles. And down here you can see they scanned this uh, Yoda head. I don't have any pictures of our actual collaboration because I was working a lot in uh, archaeological collections. Um, and as I said, the Chickasaw retained all the data for our project, so they have access to that. Um, but here we have Yoda. You can see they scanned him standing up first and then they laid him down and scanned him again and the app will actually merge to the two meshes to try and get a better um, model shape basically. Um, here is uh, some examples of materials that are different, difficult to scan. Um, the teddy bear, you know, it's fuzzy. That's not going to pick up good. The scissors, too thin. Um, we actually tried to do a honor medal from the Chickasaw Nation, and it scanned great on one side, but you couldn't stand it up to make it scan to be a 3D thing. Uh, there's also rings. We tried a ring. It was just too small. Um, Anything metallic reflects the clone mat in the scan. So you can actually see the clone mat reflected like in the thing on the texture layer. Uh, this picture down here at the bottom is a pretty good representation of like what the scans that we took that were successful looked like. Um, as you can see, this shoe was scanned 
to this model. Um, and it's it's a pretty good model, um, but there are, as you can see, some flaws that if you wanted to possibly 3D print this in the future or something, that would be a problem. And that can be taken care of in post-processing. But since I was only there for two weeks, um, what the Chickasaw decided that they wanted to see was that um, I would capture some scans with clone and then follow up with cat capturing a separate photo data set for every single object that I scanned and cloned basically to where they have those photo data sets to go back and do the digital photogrammetry in the future um, if they find some kind of photogrammetry software that works better for their needs which we are still working on if anybody knows anything feel free to let me know but um yeah so that is basically how we captured our data and we had several successful scans um the most successful scans I would say were scans of moccasins um beaded moccasins uh and yeah so that was basically the project and we used a light box setup um with a turntable an automatic turntable on the inside and then set that clone map in the light box setup so all the pictures were as good as quality as we could get them um while having to use an iphone x as the actual camera to take the picture so you know you know you sacrifice some things for that consumer um type of program and that brings us on to suggestions for future work uh, and I'll bring this down here, here to where y'all can see. Okay, so we recommend that an intern position basically be established by the UA Museum System, whose focus would be to carry out research proposed by the tribal stakeholders collaboratively with interested tribal entities. This would establish an opportunity for productive work to be undertaken, training rising scholars and in support of UA stakeholder communities. And on that note, it would be nice to see a situation where they could submit maybe like some kind of memorandum detailing like research projects that they would be interested in or any um, research interest, exhibiting ideas, collection management needs, development goals, et cetera, things like that. I, I foresee a situation where maybe Bill Bomar or somebody like that with UA Museums, since UA Museum certificate students have to do an internship anyway to graduate with their curriculum, why not go ahead and set up some kind of basically system to where somebody can move straight into that if they choose to. The same way they have set up um, the paleontology intern who goes and images all the um, paleontological whatever they got going on in Smith. <laughs> But we think that that would be a nice development. Um, students could match up their expertise and interests with the tribal nation's needs this way, and it would be an excellent opportunity to support our stakeholders while um, academically developing UA's people and students at UA. Um, and for any potential collaborations, we suggest having communication just off the bat, which includes um, makes plain all information such as each participating nation or museum or institution scope of collections their collection handling guides um, and establish rights off the bat and expectations for um, any brief any anything that is developed from the project basically um, and future collaborations will also benefit uh, from scheduled planning meetings that are like consistently scheduled, say like do one, like one meeting once a month or something like that, once every two weeks to just have a consistent check-in schedule. We thought that that would be a good thing to suggest. Um, and you should also address details on how your research is going to be carried out, um, projected dates for check-ins and deadlines and arrangement for any physical space and or equipment that you'll be needed and monetary arrangements if that's needed as well. Um, but this situation, if it could be formed, would basically promote sustainable development for UA museums and professional growth opportunities for UA students, which at this point, there are a lot of museum professionals that have a mind to collaborate, but they weren't trained coming up in collaboration per se. So this is a good opportunity for us to get into it while we're young, get used to it before we go out into the world, and then be more productive while we're out there. And then I would like to say... And thank you to my uh, committee members and all of my Chickasaw partners. Um, and yeah, so here are my sources if anybody is interested in taking a picture. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, so I would say definitely they are inherently connected because I was working on some archaeological collections and even those models were considered something that they wouldn't want other people seeing. So I, I see that as them connecting those models to those objects. Um, the historical objects, like things from the families of important Chickasaws that have donated their stuff to the Chickasaw Cultural Center, those are the most um, successful scans that we had. Uh, something that we had a lot of problems with was actually the archaeological collections were usually a lot of bowls. Um, and as you can see, bowls suck for clone. Um, <laughs> I don't know like what the beef is, but Dr. Tokovini and me tried for like a couple of hours one day to figure out the issue, but clones, I think it's the AR dome, like the AR dome doesn't recognize concave versus convex surfaces. So like that bowl, it would make a circle and be like, yeah, and the editing features in apps aren't good enough to like make a mesh actually like look anything like a bowl, if that makes sense, because you have to use your fingers and things. So at that point, you would have to switch to a computer, like post post processing thing, and it'd just be a whole different thing. So yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, do you think the next steps now that we're going to say finish? Are you going to yeah, yeah, I kind of like, I, I have a bad habit of, I have a lot of projects up in the air all at once, so that's probably going to be one of those things where I'm like, in like two years from now, I'm like, hey, Adrian, how is the da-da-da, because I heard about this, and then I provide them with whatever information I've heard of, I'm just kind of like get as much information as I can and see myself as like eyes and ears for them because that's like also part of the collaboration is like getting additional eyes and ears to look for different kinds of resources and things that we can use so yeah I'll I'll, I'll stick with them I bet yeah anybody else yeah With cultural what rights? Um, when you say cultural expression rights, do you mean like the Hatchsoft like yeah. licensing issue? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I haven't. And with our particular project, that all that data was belonging to the Chipsaw anyway. So anybody that was trying to get that data would have to go through them, which is the appropriate means anyway. So yeah, we just kind of did a situation where any data, any expectant rights was for the Chickasaw Nation, whereas I provided labor and um, I trained their people while I was there on basically what I was doing. That way when I left, and that, I guess that draws into your question, Jessica, but once I leave, people still know how to do all this because I trained people while I was there. That's a that's an important thing to put in the presentation. I trained people while I was there on how to do this. I showed them what I was doing. Um, I explained the differences between the software um, and basically why we use Agisol in that shape and why we prefer it. But um, yeah, did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. So I couldn't use Agisol in that shape due to the licensing issue for an extended amount of time. And I was looking for, you know, free open source software. Yeah. I should be like looking for something. Yeah, like same. That. So um, what I've been using is Meshroom. Okay, yeah, I've heard it. Pretty nice. You like you it? Do small that could do okay. Well. So you can have pretty good information and you can use no based by algorithm. So and not that many um there's not that many options. Yeah. Yes, uh, but that's when you can move the 3D, 3D model into like Bash Lab to yeah. also like help you, you know, post processing, but mm -hmm. I really like Blender. Blender. So this is very, um, I think we can really do a lot with Blender. If you ever want to create like immersive scenes, like movement, like a mm -hmm. different animation. Yeah, like being like in an environment type thing. Yeah, that exactly. makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm still like looking for Blender, buying tutorials, but like mm -hmm. this is all free access. Cool. And yeah, I would 
Yeah, I will let you know. Thank right. you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, fellas. I appreciate your coming. <laughs>
classic Maya sites at the time. Um, and in the 1970s, the presence of inscribed stones was reported at the site. Someone found some inscribed stones and they went and investigated them. And it turned out to be three hieroglyphic stairways. Um, and this is pictures of the stairways after they were cleaned up a bit. On the left, we have stairway one, which consists of 101 carved blocks, and it was likely commissioned around 529 CE. And you can see that some of the blocks look like they've tumbled down from their original location. You, you can make out like the remnants of the first step and the second step, but then of course there's this big tree in the middle. Um, so some parts of the stairway have fallen out of order, but large sections of it have withstood the test of time um, and they retain their original order. And so some parts of the stairway are, are actually legible. And then on the right, we have stairway three, which has 91 carved blocks. It was likely commissioned in 569 CE. And again, it looks like some blocks have fallen down, um, but of the blocks that are still in their original rows, uh, if you try to read them, they don't make sense, like they don't form a narrative. Um, and so it's likely that the Maya made this stairway and then actually like intentionally reordered the blocks, um, which seems like a bit of a strange thing to do, but the reuse and modification of monuments was actually pretty common in the Maya world. And this actually isn't the only hieroglyphic stairway um, that was intentionally scrambled. And then in the middle, we have stairway two, which only has 11 carved block. it's blocks. It's interspersed with um, blank blocks. And the size and style of the blocks, based on the size and style, it's likely that they came from stairway three. Um, so my project is largely comparing stairway one and stairway three. So um, once these blocks were found, they were photographed, as you can see, and then they were moved to a city called Chetamal, which is near the site. Um, and they still are there today. But um, they risk, even though they're in like a climate controlled environment now, the risk of degradation is, is still present. Um, and so in 2020, a new project began with the aim of creating a 3D scan of, of each block. Um, so it, one of the project's goals was to preserve the blocks. Um, and then here you can see on the left, this is the room where the blocks are currently stored. Uh, here, two of the people we were working with are using a crane to move one of the largest blocks. Most of the blocks could just be carted around in like a wheeled cart and the smaller ones could just be carried by hand. And then on the right, um, this is us 3D scanning a block. You have the block here and then the 3D scanner. And we would essentially move the 3D scanner around the block um, to create a model. And each model consisted of 20 to 60 scans roughly. Um, although not, we didn't, we didn't create a 3D scan for the whole block. For most of the blocks, we actually didn't scan the back. Uh, we documented the back with photogrammetry, which we just heard a lot about in Lily's presentation. So when we got back to the University of Alabama, we had a model made from the 3D scanner and a model made from photogrammetry. And then we would merge those two models and that would leave us uh, with a complete model of, um, of each block. And it's really, really useful to have these 3D scans. Like there's so much that we can figure out about the blocks from the 3D scans, it makes it a lot easier. Um, for example, there's a software I used a lot called Geomagic Wrap, where you can import the 3D model of a block and then you can like create slices. Um, so here we have a profile view of one of the blocks. This is the face of the block, like where the inscription would be, and then the top of the block and the bottom of the block. Um, and then here we have a bird's eye view with the face of the block here, and then the left side of the block and the right side of the block. And here's the complete model. So there were a number of measurements that I was able to pull from these models. And those include length, width, height, volume, and angles. Um, so with the angles, for example, in Geomagic Wrap, you're able to select uh, like a face, one face of the block, like let's say the top, for example, and then create a best fit line. Um, so this is a best fit line here. And then you can create another best fit line for another another face or another plane. And then you can find the angle between those two planes. Um, so for all of the blocks that I had, I calculated the angle between the face and the top and also the angle between the face and the left side um, and the right side. Um, so like you can see here, for example, that this angle looks to be more or less perpendicular, whereas this one is less than 90 degrees. Um, and this is a, a corner block actually. So this is pretty common with corner blocks. Um, because the corner would be a 90 degree angle. And then on the other side, um, you'd want to create some room for to put some stucco and then put the next block. Um, so a lot of the blocks end up being trapezoidal 
in their angles um, to create room for stucco. Um, so yeah, another, another really useful thing about these 3D scans is that it allows us to study the blocks without having to be in Chatham Mall. Um, and it allows us to study the blocks without risking uh, damage to them. So overall, it's just really useful. And another um, thing that I've been able to do um, is create uh, 3D uh, models, like 3D prints. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think I'm visible on screen, but um, so yeah, so I, I created 3D models at 15% scale. Um, and most of the data that I'm gonna be talking about in this presentation comes from Geomagic Wrap from the measurements that I like pulled off of the scans. Um, but I think that the 3D models, the miniature models are really useful just in terms of making the project more intuitive and accessible. Um, I hope that one day we can make a museum exhibit um, of the stairway and feature the, the miniature model. And also another major bonus of the 3D models is that um, if we're looking at two blocks that were found right next to each other, we can we can put the, the miniature models together and like physically feel the extent to which they fit together. So that's like a data point that you can't really get um, from anything but the physical models. So I think that this data set is really versatile and there are a lot of different directions that someone could go down in their study of it. But um, I'm particularly curious about labor organization, like about how labor was organized to create these massive monuments and whether or not I can find clues about labor organization in the products of the labor in the stones. Um, I wanna know if the blocks will fit with dominant models of classic Maya economies. I'm curious about who built the stairways, what the chain of construction looked like, um, and also who recruited the laborers and how they were incentivized to participate. And for this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about data only from the first row of stairway one and the first row of stairway three. And I also wanna mention briefly some of the issues that I ran into um, when figuring out how to analyze my data and take these measurements because so I, I was looking at row one of stairway one and row one of stairway three, and I was really curious about variability. Like for example, is the shape of stairway one, the shape of stairway one block, is that more variable than the shape of stairway three? Um, and to, to gauge variability, I was looking a lot at standard deviation, but I realized that standard deviation can't always help me answer this question because it's skewed by scale. Um, and stairway one is basically like a scaled up version of stairway three, it's it's larger. Um, but I, I didn't, and obviously scale is something that we need to keep in mind, but I didn't want it to totally dominate my analysis of variability. Um, so I, I figured out a way to normalize standard deviation. That's what I'm calling it. So in these two sample data sets here, you have data set A and data set B. Um, in both cases, the ratio between the smallest value and the largest value is the same. And in my in looking at variability, that's something I'm really interested in. Um, but if you were to just compare the standard deviation, the standard deviation for data set A is way, way larger because the values are larger. Um, so I realized that if you take the average of set A and the average of set B, divide those, and then take that product and divide it by the standard deviation of set A, you can basically scale this value down to be the same as this value. Um, so if you see an asterisk on standard deviation values going forward, that means that I've applied this transformation. Um, and another really useful transformation that I came across in my research is the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation divided by the mean, and then you can multiply it by 100 to get a percent. Um, so here again, we have data set A and data set B, and Calculating the coefficient of variation actually allows you to bypass the standard deviation normalization thing completely, uh, and it gives you a percent of variation. Um, and for data set A and data set B, they're the same, and, and that's what I wanted. Um, but one of the limitations with, with normalizing the standard deviation is that it doesn't really allow you to like compare across data sets. So if we add, yeah, I just made these data sets up, but data set C and data set D, um, and then calculate their st standard deviations. Um, the standard deviation of data set C, for example, is way, way smaller than data set A and data set B. But I wanted to like be able to have all of these uh, data sets on the same scale. So the coefficient of variation is really useful for that because it just creates a percent um, for all of them. And then here we can see of all these data sets, data set D is like by far the most variable and data set C is by far the least variable. And that's a conclusion that you couldn't draw 
if you didn't have the coefficient of variation, if you were only looking at standard deviations. So going forward, I'm using both standard deviation and coefficient of variation. Um, so I had two main hypotheses going into this research. Um, and it's important to note that like, I was kind of looking at the blocks as like a product of two distinct processes, um, which maybe is a bit of a generalization, but I do think it's better than looking at the blocks as just, you know, a kind of like one thing. Um, so for example, I, I was seeing like these carved blocks as the first you have to get the stone and then shape it into a blank block. And then once you have that blank block, you have to carve glyphs on it. So it's like two separate processes. Um, so first I was looking at the shaping of blocks and I hypothesized that the shape of stairway one blocks would be more homogeneous than the shape of stairway three blocks. I identified eight variables that I believe uh, indicate block shaping practices and five out of these eight variables supported my hypothesis. The first one I looked at uh, was height. You can see here just like a frontal view of stairway one and a frontal view of stairway three. And like looking at them, you may be able to guess which one, which is more variable in terms of block height. Um, but it is useful, of course, to, to make sure that the data backs that up. So we can see that the average um, height of stairway one blocks is uh, much larger which uh, 371 compared to 327. And that makes sense because as I said, stairway one is like a scaled up version of stairway three, um, but the coefficient of variation is larger for stairway three. So in terms of height, stairway three is more variable. So because stairway three is more variable in terms of height, that supports my hypothesis that stairway one is more homogeneous. Uh, I also looked at top and bottom angle measurements. So that would be like the angle between the face of the block and the top of the block and the bottom of the block and the face of the block. Both of these measurements were uh, more consistent for stairway one. Uh, here you can see the data for the angle between the face of the block and the top of the block. Uh, the coefficient of variation is smaller for stairway one. And interestingly, whoever made stairway one consistently uh, crafted their blocks with an obtuse angle between the top and the face. You know, you'd think for a stairway that a perpendicular angle would be more functional, but yeah, for stairway one, it was always, pretty much always an obtuse angle because uh, we have an average of 94 versus 90. And then we have the left and right angle measurements, uh, which both also supported my hypothesis and were less variable for stairway one. Um, but the three variables that didn't support my hypothesis were length, width, and volume. And I also think that these variables are the easiest to anticipate just by looking at this picture, like volume, for example. Um, you can see pretty clearly like stairway one is definitely more variable in terms of volume. I mean, this block on the left here is the largest block in the whole data set. And then it's right next to this really small block. Um, so stairway one is more variable in terms of volume and also in terms of length and width. Um, my second hypothesis had to do with carving style. Um, so like how, who, who was carving these glyphs and, and what was their style? I identified four variables that I believe indicate carving style, glyph carving style, and four out of these four variables supported my hypothesis. And um, I hypothesized that the carving style of stairway one would be more homogeneous than the carving style of stairway three. And I decided to make this my hypothesis because stairway one actually has signatures on both ends of the first row. Um, so that makes it more likely that there was one person who was responsible for carving that first row of stairway one and then they just signed their name on both sides to indicate that they did that so i guess i, I kind of wanted to test if um if it was indeed one person or one group who was responsible for carving stairway one um, whereas whereas with stairway three maybe it was multiple people uh the first variable that i looked at here was the distance between the bottom of the block and the bottom of the cartouche. Um, so you can see with this red line, how I measured that. I didn't go all the way down to the lowest point of the block. I just went to the end of the face of the block. Um, and here I'm, I'm looking at standard deviation. So the standard deviation is smaller for stairway one. So that does support my hypothesis. Um, stairway one, also the, the mean is smaller. So like consistently stairway one blocks had a, a smaller distance between the bottom of the cartouche and the bottom of the block. Uh, and then I also considered distance between the top of the block and the bottom of the cartouche, which you can see here. Um, and this was slightly less variable for stairway one, but not that much more variable. It's 12.17 uh, versus 13.58. 
Uh, you can also see that the average height of this measurement is larger for stairway one, which again is to be expected because stairway one is just larger. I also looked at the height of the cartouche. Um, on average, it's larger for stairway one and it's significantly less variable for stairway one. Whoever made stairway one had a very consistent style in terms of the height of their cartouches. They just had like a way of doing that and they pretty much always did it that way. Um, stairway three is much more variable in this regard and, and the range for stairway three is, is way larger. And then I also finally looked at the thickness of the cartouche, which I measured uh, at four points and then just took the average for each block. And so you can see that the average cartouche thickness for stairway one is way larger. Like stairway one just had thicker cartouches and it's less variable. Um, so yeah, those are the four variables I looked at for glyph carving practices. So in conclusion, um, I believe it's safe to say that the data does support both of my hypotheses, albeit to different degrees. Um, and some of these conclusions are clear just from looking at the blocks, like the volume, for example, whereas others only come to light after collecting and analyzing the measurements. Um, so I think there are a few uh, potential conclusions that can be drawn about labor organization and about um, economies. So um, stairway one was likely produced by one person or one group because it's so much more homogenous in its style, whereas stairway three was perhaps produced by multiple people or multiple groups. And then in terms of block shape, um, the homogeneity of stairway one could mean that blocks came from just one workshop where everyone made blocks the same way. Um, whereas to me, it looks like stairway three blocks came from a market. So you know, a bunch of different people with different backgrounds who made blocks in different ways and then just sold their blocks at a market and then someone came and, and picked them up. Um, it looks to me like the products of many different people. Although if patterns appear in stairway three, then it could instead be a case of corvée labor. Um, it's also interesting to note the, the degree of correspondence between block shape and glyph style among the two stairways. Um, this degree of correspondence is greater for stairway one. So it could be that maybe for stairway one, whoever was shaping the blocks was also carving the glyphs. Whereas for stairway three, I think it's more likely that they were separate processes that one person was shaping the blocks and then they got sent off to somewhere else, some, someone else to, um, to inscribe them. Um, so this could be a case of segmented production. Overall, these findings support the notion of a dual economy where attached specialists and decentralized market vendors work simultaneously but separately as part, part of a larger heterarch heterarchical system. Chances are that the carvers of the glyphs were attached specialists in both cases, but for stairway one, state control extended down to block shape, whereas for stairway three, the early stages of stone production occurred in a decentralized and non-elite economy. Um, I'd like to thank everyone on my committee um, and also um, my friends and family who have supported me throughout the process. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi. I was just wondering, may have mentioned it, I might have just missed it, but what led you to come up with your original hypothesis in the first place about the homogeneity of the target experiment one versus target experiment two? Is that Dana? Yes. yes. Were you able to, uh, I'm sorry, hear Dana, I can't hear you. Okay, so do you want to just come up here? <clears throat> <laughs> All right, can you, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, so I was wondering um, what led you to come up with your hypotheses the way that you formulated them in the first place, that the HS1 was going to be more homogenous in the shaping of the blocks than HS3. Was that based on just like visual or? Yeah, well, in terms of um, the glyph style, it was largely based on the signatures. Um, and also, I... I think that the stairway one blocks look like they have a more shallow relief in terms of like the depth of the carving. And that's actually not a variable that I've included, but um, I just recently got an email from uh, my advisor, Dr. Tokovanine saying that he also thinks that the relief is more shallow. So that's something that's like consistent, consistent for stairway one for glyph style. And then in terms of why I hypothesized that um, 
the shape of the blocks would be more consistent for stairway one. That was mostly just based on on looking at it. And yeah, you know, I felt like I had to like make a guess one way or another. So I just decided to guess that stairway one would be more consistent. Okay, thank you. Any questions on Zoom for the people on Zoom? I can just start by Sorry, I didn't hear that. Dr. Tocavini was just clarifying some of the stuff. Oh. Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you both for presenting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Claire, I just said that because there's a signature that's more likely it's like a more organized process than okay. there are no signatures. So I just clarify that a little bit to grow. Okay. Well, right, I didn't you. ask any questions. I just oh, okay. I I, was, I I thought I heard you say clarify, so I, I assumed it wasn't a question, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, thank okay. Thank you.